Am I in focus? Hopefully, yes. Hello, uh, my name is Isabel. If you didn't already know, uh, welcome back to my channel. Uh, I'm currently sitting on my kitchen floor, very Trisha Paytas of me. Um, and this is a video that I've been putting off making for quite a while, but I thought it was finally time. Uh, and my parents are out right now, so I thought this would be a good opportunity. Um, I did say four years ago that my New Year's resolution was to post on YouTube once a week and I think I've posted once or twice since then, so safe to say I'm not good with New Year's resolutions, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to make this video today and hopefully upload it before tomorrow because I finally want to talk about what I went through two years ago, January 2018, which was my journey with sepsis. So for those of you who don't know, I'm not entirely sure exactly what the medical definition of sepsis is, but this is my understanding from having it, is that uh, sepsis happens when you get a very severe infection and your body struggles to fight the infection, so it kind of takes over your whole body. Um, sepsis is also sometimes referred to as blood poisoning uh, because your body kind of starts almost attacking itself. Um, if that's wrong, I feel like I should put a definition, like an official definition right here. But yeah, so I had that. Um, and I just feel like it was important for me to talk about it now because I got sepsis when I got a wisdom tooth removed. And uh, I have three more and I'm finally taking the plunge and getting another one removed tomorrow. It's taken me a while to get to the point where I can do that and it's taken me a while to get to the point where I can talk about what happened to me. And I've had a few questions, especially because I'm, I'm telling people that I'm getting my wisdom tooth removed tomorrow, which can be like very routine for, for lots of people, but for me it's kind of a big deal. But it would kind of just be easiest to just make a video and then if anyone asks about it, I can link it to them. And if anyone stumbles upon this video and finds this helpful, then I'm really glad. And especially given what's going on right now, sepsis can be one of the complications of COVID-19. So I thought it would be useful for people just to know how to identify it, like what, I, what my symptoms were when I had it, and kind of how I got over that whole experience. So um, it all began January 2018. Uh, I think it was either the third or the fourth. I had an appointment at the hospital to get my wisdom tooth removed. Uh, it was my first ever wisdom tooth removal. I was nervous, but I was pretty okay. I thought this is something that people go through all the time. The reason I had to go to the hospital was because it was a bottom, my bottom right wisdom tooth, and it was impacted, so it was gonna be a little bit tricky for them to do it in the dentist's office. I did have a sore throat the day that I got it taken out, but I did mention that to the dentist, and she said it would be totally fine. And I also had had like kind of a bad taste coming from that tooth for a couple of months, but I did have an x-ray taken, and nobody mentioned that there was anything strange on the x-ray, so as far as we were concerned, it was just another wisdom tooth removal. So I went in, I was nervous, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't terrified. In the Netherlands, they don't do any sedation or anything, they just do local anesthesia. So they began administering the injections down there. Um, they kind of told me what to expect. They said, you'll feel pressure, you won't feel any pain because um, obviously they had to cut the tooth into four pieces to get it removed. Um, so they said, you'll feel some pressure when we're cutting in, but you shouldn't feel any pain. They kept asking me, like, are you comfortable? And I said, no, actually, I can still feel something. So they kept giving me more local anesthesia. Um, and they tried again, and they were like, can you still feel it? And I was like, yeah, I can still feel it. And then they gave me more local anesthesia. Um, Basically, long story short, the anesthesia wasn't really working properly, but obviously they had to continue with the procedure. Uh, sometimes my gum would be numb, but then when they would get to actually cutting my tooth open, I would feel some pain from that. Um, so it got to the point where it was starting to get really uncomfortable. Um, it got to the point where I was experiencing pain and not pressure, but because they'd already kind of drilled into the tooth and cut it into a couple of pieces, and the dentist told me they'd already given me the maximum amount of local anesthesia that they were allowed to. There kind of just wasn't really any choice. Uh, they just had to keep going and finish the procedure. So safe to say at that point I was a little bit distressed. Um, I could basically feel everything that was going on in my mouth. And obviously I was wondering why, why that was the case. They finished the procedure, they stitched me up. At this point I was in tears. I was, I was 
crying, I was kind of panicking. Um, and then they asked me like, do you want to keep the tooth? And I was like, instantly, I was like, absolutely not. I do not want to remember any of this experience. As soon as they took the tooth out, it was like, like the swelling started up really heavy. And then when I touched my face, it was like rock solid, which obviously I've never had a wisdom tooth removal before. So I was like, could be normal. So I went out, I was sobbing. I felt really bad for all the people in the waiting room because I wasn't exactly a model patient. Um, I came out sobbing because obviously I'd felt everything and it was just not a great experience for me. I got the aftercare instructions and then I, got, I went home and kind of just lay in bed and kind of calmed down a little bit. And then I thought, okay, like now I just need to recover. So, the first couple of hours, the painkillers were working. I was making sure that I stayed on top of my painkillers. Um, my face was still really, really swollen and really hard, and I was icing it, and at this point, we thought that everything was normal. I was in a lot of pain, so I decided to take uh, some painkillers before I tried to go to sleep, and after like an hour, they still really hadn't kicked in. Um, and at this point, I was in a lot, a lot of pain. And it wasn't just pain, it felt like my cheek was gonna explode. It was a lot of pressure, it was just, a lot of not nice feelings um, but you know I tried to go to sleep anyways and when I was lying there I just like all of a sudden felt like I had to vomit by the way warning to anybody watching this video uh, there's some pretty graphic stuff um, I might include pictures as well of what my face looked like and my MRI and x-rays and stuff like that so if you're not into that I'll make sure that I put a warning before I put it on the screen um, but I will be talking about <laughs> bodily functions and stuff like that, so if you're not into that, <laughs> please don't watch this video. So when I was lying in bed, I was trying to get to sleep, and all of a sudden I felt like I had to throw up. So I ran to the bathroom, and obviously it's not ideal to throw up when you've just had your wisdom tooth removed, because it can actually dislodge the blood clot that your body has formed. So at that point, my only concern was I don't want to throw up because I don't want to like dislodge the blood clot. I threw up, I was really not feeling well. Uh, my face was still very, very painful, but I thought, okay, like I just need to keep icing it. I just need to get to sleep. Like this day has just been overwhelming. I just need to go to bed. So I went back to bed. About 15 minutes later, I had to go throw up again. Um, and that kind of went on for the entire night. Um, I think I was throwing up from like midnight till like 6 a.m. maybe every half hour. We wanted to wait to go back to the dental surgery where I'd had the surgery to begin with. Um, and that was opening at like 6 a.m. or something. So we were like, okay, if we can just like hold down the fort until that clinic opens and then we can go there and see what's going on. Um, I should mention in the meantime, I spiked a really high fever. I was at about 41 degrees Celsius. I have no idea what that is in uh, Fahrenheit, but I'll put it on the screen. Um, so yeah, safe to say I was just not feeling <laughs> well at all. Um, I was feeling very dazed and confused. I was throwing up all the time, as I said. I had a really high fever. Um, and at this point, like, I just couldn't really register what was happening to me. Um, and my parents were obviously very concerned. We were on the phone with the the healthcare workers in the Netherlands. Um, I'm not ex I'm not exactly sure who they were talking to because I just was like completely out of it at this point. But we were on the phone talking to someone. They said like you know it's fine. Just wait until the morning when you can go to the dentist's office again. We're kind of just doing the best that we could. Um, I couldn't keep down anything. I couldn't keep down water. Nothing. If I drank water like ten minutes later, I was throwing up again. Um, and at this point, my face was like feeling very, very warm to the touch. Um, so yeah, so it was <laughs> not a good night at all. I didn't really know what was happening. We finally got to the time where we could call a taxi. Um, at this point, TMI, I uh, had lost basically complete, uh, complete control of my bodily functions. So at this point, I definitely knew something was wrong because that's never happened to me before. Um, but yeah, it was really bad. We had to basically wait until I'd just thrown up to get into the taxi because we knew like 15 minutes later that it would happen again. Uh, we got to the hospital and I got put straight in a wheelchair because I basically couldn't walk anymore. Um, I basically just lost all cognitive functioning. Um, so they wheeled me over to the, the dental area 
um, I threw up multiple times in the waiting room so like the receptionist and the doctors could see what was happening to me. Then the dentist who removed my tooth came out and she just said, okay, well, I'm gonna prescribe you some morphine for the pain and then you should go home and rest. Um, which, if I had taken that advice, I wouldn't be here right now because um, obviously now in hindsight we know that I was suffering from sepsis and that hour could have made a massive difference. But at that point I was so sick and I felt like if I closed my eyes they would not open again. Um, so I basically insisted that they keep me at the hospital. I said, I really feel like I'm going to die. Um, please, like, get me in a bed, take my blood, something. Like, please just look at me. I was really, really desperate at that point to just be in the hospital because I really felt like I had to be there. So I finally got into bed. I, I, I'd been throwing up this whole time. They finally got an IV in me. They took my blood. They started me on IV antibiotics right away. And about an hour later, they came in and said that my C-reactive protein, which is part of your blood test, was at a 337, which is absolutely septic levels. So at that point, we knew, like, okay, this is really serious. So, yeah, safe to say, those were not the results that we wanted, but, uh, like, I was glad that we finally had some kind of answer as to why I was going through what I was going through. Um, so I was in the hospital for like that whole day from the morning till the evening um, and once they'd gotten those test results back that said that my CRP was 337, um, they said basically that they were not equipped to deal with my case anymore. Um, they basically said that should something take a turn for the worse, they wouldn't you know, have the proper surgeons and they wouldn't have the proper medication to actually help with my case. But they recommended that I get transferred to a different hospital in the Netherlands that was a bigger hospital that had more facilities and that had more specialized doctors. Um, they did say that I had to go in an ambulance because I was not stable enough to come off of my IV or anything. So we had to wait a couple of hours for me to get in the ambulance. Um, the ambulance people were very nice. I was still in a lot of pain. I was. I was exhausted, like I just drifted in and out of sleep that whole day because my body was fighting something. I don't want to mention any names by the way because I don't want to um, suggest that, you know, anyone was bad or good. Um, it's just the experience that happened to me and I, I absolutely don't blame anyone in particular for this experience. It was a freak accident um, and I've been told many times that like they'd never seen this happen before, so <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to say that anyone was great or bad. Um, I will say that the hospital that I went to took very good care of me and kept me very informed the whole time and I felt very comfortable at the hospital that I was transferred to. As soon as I got there, they got me into a room. Um, I was really lucky, it was a two-person room and the other bed wasn't taken, so I essentially had a private room, um, which was like perfect for me. Um, at this point, I was on morphine, but that wasn't enough for the pain, so I was on a bunch of, a bunch of different pills. Um, I just was not with it at all, um, yeah, I think like <laughs> I just wasn't really there for three or four days because I was on all these different medications and obviously my body was fighting a very heavy infection. Um, I should mention as well at this point my face was huge, uh, way past what you would call normal swelling um, and also something that alerted us to the fact that it could be sepsis was that I started to get really red um, and the redness was spreading down my neck. Um, I'll put a photo in here. Um, the doctors, as soon as I got to the second hospital, started marking off where the red lines were. And then every morning and every afternoon, they would mark off where it had spread to, um, because that was basically their best way of seeing if the infection was still spreading. So they started tracing the red lines. I was just on antibiotics. Um, they took a bunch of MRIs and x-rays and CT scans and ultrasounds to see if they could find some sort of infection that was in my face that they could drain and therefore help with the infection. But nothing was coming up on any of the scans. Uh, the only thing that they could see was that my fat cells themselves had become infected. Um, which is not really possible to treat with anything other than IV antibiotics, as far as I'm aware. I'm not sure. Uh, again, I'm not a doctor, and I basically wasn't there for most of this experience, so I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> because they'd already started the antibiotics in the other hospital, they weren't able to get any conclusive results from those blood tests about what 
the infection could be. So they weren't able to tailor my uh, antibiotics specifically for whatever the infection was. So I was put on just kind of a cocktail of general antibiotics, um, anti-inflammatories, painkillers. It was just, just kind of had like a cocktail of stuff. Um, and then I would also take pills orally, um, but they had to be very small because my tonsils were, and my throat was actually so swollen that my tonsils were touching. Um, and I was at risk of uh, my throat closing and not being able to breathe or swallow anything. So they really tried to limit what I took in orally, um, including food. I had to be on like protein shakes um, for basically the whole week that I was there. Um, so I ended up being in the hospital there for, I think, four days. Um, on the fourth day, I was allowed to go home, which was great timing because my boyfriend at the time was coming to visit. Um, and I was feeling a lot better, I was feeling more awake. I was discharged from the hospital um, and I was given some antibiotics to take while I was at home. So I did that, I took them religiously. I was still extremely exhausted, my face was still swollen and they thought, you know, hopefully with the antibiotics it would slowly go away, but they did tell me it could take like a month, a month and a half for the swelling to go down and for the infection to go down. So I knew I was in for like a long ride. So I was supposed to go back to school like that week sometime. I had a flight to New York booked, my parents had a flight back to Singapore booked. Um, but obviously with this infection, the doctors were like, absolutely no, you cannot go back. Like you have to be in the country. Um, I was going for checkups like every two days at the hospital to check my blood levels and to get scans and stuff. So there was no way that I was gonna make it back to uh, New York on time to start the spring semester which was a really tough pill to swallow. I was really excited to go back. I had just done a semester abroad in London, so it had been about eight months since I'd been back in New York anyway. Um, I was really excited to see my friends. I was really excited to go back, um, but unfortunately I wasn't able to at that time. So yeah, so I spent some time, I think it was like three or four days with my boyfriend when he was here to visit. Um, and then one day we were on the bus home. As I said, I was still extremely tired, but I was I was trying to like show him around Amsterdam and you know do fun things. It was the last time we were gonna be together before I went off to university. So, you know, I didn't want to just be at home in bed the whole time. So yeah, it was it was kind of a difficult time for me because I knew I had to say goodbye to him at the end of it and I knew I wasn't gonna be going. So um, I definitely felt very emotional at this time um, and that could definitely be to do with all the, the medication that I was on and and all of the stress of what I'd gone through um, but we were on the bus home one day and I fell asleep on his shoulder with like here and when I woke up the redness was back um, and I thought it's fine it's just because I slept on his sweater and like you know it's probably something like that um, but then my face started to get hot again uh, it basically just seemed like I'd irritated that that part of my face again. Um, I can actually insert a photo of the redness here. <laughs> um, so yeah, my parents were like, we need to go back. We, and I really didn't want to because I knew it would probably be bad news. Um, but yeah, so I dropped my boyfriend at the time off at the airport, from the airport to the hospital. Uh, and as soon as I went in, they were like, okay, we need to do another scan to see if there's, you know, anything there that we can drain or something that we can, you know, some source of infection that we can get out of your body. So they took me in for an ultrasound scan. They said they were going, the plan of action was they were going to do an ultrasound. If they found an abscess, they would try and go in through the outside with like a huge <laughs> needle, a thick, huge needle to kind of drain anything that was in there through the needle um, and they said if that doesn't work we will be going to surgery so <laughs> so those were the two options obviously going into the ultrasound I was really really hoping that they were gonna be able to get whatever was in there out with the needle um, safe to say it did not go that way um, and I was like absolutely devastated hmm. I was absolutely devastated um, at this point, my mom had flown back to Denmark to be with our friend whose son had just passed away. Um, it was a very important trip for her, and we all agreed, like, my mom had to go. Uh, my mom had gone off to Copenhagen, so it was me and my dad. Um, and yeah, so we did the ultrasound, they put the needle in. It was an extremely 
extremely uncomfortable procedure. Um, it was a very long, thick needle, as I said. I had some uh, some local anesthesia, but that was it, and it really didn't go deeper. It, it did not go as deep as the needle went, let's say that. Um, and they did the ultrasound at the same time, so they could see the needle kind of going into this pocket that there was there. Um, but it was too thick that they couldn't actually... This is, <laughs> this is disgusting, by the way. I should put a warning. Warning, this is disgusting. Um, the, the pus that was inside was basically too thick to actually be pulled out with the needle. Um, and safe to say I had a complete mental breakdown uh, in the ultrasound chair because we all knew exactly what that meant, which was that I was going to have to go in for an emergency procedure to drain the abscess surgically. <sighs> it's still kind of shit to talk about. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, so we went back to the maxillofacial surgeon and you know he said the words you're gonna have to have surgery and I absolutely lost it I should mention that um, I am a performer I am an actor and I was very worried about you know the consequences of having a scar on my face um, and he did say he wanted to kind of do an incision right here on my face Safe to say I was not having that, so in the midst of like this huge breakdown, I basically just said like, is there anything else that you can do? Because like I really, like I, I would be more comfortable with the surgery if I knew that I didn't have to have, you know, a scar on my face afterwards. So they did say that they had another option which was to go here under my neck um, and they would try and kind of squeeze everything out there. Um, they did say that it would be, it would leave more bruising after the procedure and it would be more difficult to get everything out. But at that point, like, <laughs> that was kind of the only thing that was giving me hope was that I wasn't going to have a huge scar on my face. Um, and even then, they said they would try uh, going through the neck, but they might still have to go through my face. So I kind of went under not knowing what I was going to wake up with. Um, they actually scheduled the surgery for like three hours after I had that meeting with them because um, they thought it was like it was really it was a time sensitive thing um, if that abscess had burst you know it could have been fatal for me so I called my mom I told her that I was going in for surgery they took me straight in I didn't get to go home before I before I went for surgery I got straight into my gown they prepped me for everything they put the IV in um, and my dad was so great and like I would not have been able to go through that whole thing without him um, and he basically said to me like the calmer you are when you go in the calmer you will be when you wake up so I kind of really took that to heart and um, they wheeled me into the operating room a picture in here of what I look like when I woke up um, I really had no idea what to expect I didn't know if the scar was gonna be all the way under my neck I didn't know what was gonna happen um, but I did feel something inside my mouth which they hadn't told me was gonna happen. Um, but turns out that they needed to put like a kind of a piece of choreograde, corrugated plastic in. So the incision was actually here and in my mouth. So I had a piece of plastic kind of going through my face, um, which I was not aware of. So that was a little bit of a surprise because I was expecting pain here, but I also ended up having pain inside my mouth. Um, it also meant that it was very difficult for me to chew or talk or even move my, my face without the plastic moving. And as you can imagine, that was incredibly inco uncomfortable. So I ended up spending about another three or four days in the hospital. I, I can't really remember. Um, and every day, three times a day, they would come in and they would kind of put like a water pump here. And they would actually pump water down the piece of plastic, so through my face, to kind of flush the infection out. Um, safe to say that was extremely uncomfortable um, and they would give me a painkiller like half an hour before they would come and do it but there was one day where um, I'd been given the pill and I'd fallen back asleep and then when I woke up the doctors were there so they ended up doing it without me having any pain relief which was very 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 uncomfortable and finally they said that it looked like uh, the drain was ready to come out, which I was very excited for but very nervous for because I didn't know what it was going to feel like to have a piece of plastic like pulled out of my face. They kind of counted down from three and then they had like some tweezers and they just pulled it straight out. What I didn't know was that they were never planning on putting stitches in, so I was now left with 
a hole through my face, um, which can be a little bit confronting when you look at yourself in the mirror and there's kind of stuff draining down your throat. So they took the drain out, they sent me home with lots of antibiotics again, a nice little cocktail of everything that I had to take three times a day. I have gargle with, uh, with some antiseptic mouthwash um, and keep the wound clean. Because as you'll remember, I still had a wisdom tooth wound that I had to keep clean. So as well as this wound, I also had to deal with what was going on inside my mouth, which had been neglected for the last week and a half because of everything else that went on. I was extremely traumatized from the experience. Um, I, when I was in hospital, I, I cried all the time. Um, I just felt like, why was this happening to me? This was supposed to be something routine that I was supposed to go through. And here I am, like I missed the first week of school for university. I'm not in New York. I had to say goodbye to my boyfriend. Um, my mom wasn't there. I just was feeling very, very sorry for myself, especially being in the Netherlands. Um, I do speak Dutch, but I've never spoken about medical things in Dutch, so in that sense I did feel a little bit like there was a communication barrier between me being able to communicate how I was feeling and the doctors being able to understand like exactly what I was going through and what I was feeling. I just, I just felt really alone um, and it was such a relief when I finally got to come home but at the same time even though everything was kind of starting to be over. Um, all of the emotions and everything that I went through the, those two weeks uh, definitely stayed with me and, and is still with me. Um, I've suffered from PTSD um, following my sepsis. Uh, as I mentioned, I have three more teeth that need to be removed and anytime I would think about doing that, I would get panic attacks, I would have nightmares. I usually cry talking about it. This is one of the first times that I've kind of been able to talk about it without you know, getting choked up, um, which I think shows that, you know, I'm ready to move on from this experience. And I think talking about it as well is really going to help me move on from what happened. Um, but yeah, safe to say I recovered. Um, this is my scar, if you can see it. I'm really happy with it. It's really small and I'm really grateful for all the doctors that helped me. Sorry, my parents came home, so I had to kind of change rooms. Um, but I was just finishing off to say, uh, everything went fine after that. I went home, I had to clean the wound out, um, I was taking my antibiotics, and a couple of days later I managed to arrange a maxillofacial surgeon in New York. Um, and yeah, so I was allowed to fly back on the strict instructions that I had to go see someone every week to make sure that I was healing properly. From then on it was kind of just, uh, emotional healing that I had to do. And I think I've done that now. It's still very difficult for me to talk about, which is why I'm making this video so I don't have to tell the story too many times. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm going in for a wisdom tooth removal tomorrow and I'm confident everything will go well. Um, I have been prescribed 10 milligrams of diazepam for the procedure just because <laughs> it is still very difficult for me to actually go in and know that I'm setting myself up for possibly something traumatic again, which I know won't happen, but yes. <laughs> so yeah, so the main symptoms that I had when I had it were extreme pain, um, like a hot feeling to the touch, um, red lines spreading, just general confusion. Um, those are really the things to look out for if you're worried that you have sepsis. Um, but yeah, I don't really know what else to say. Um, it's, yeah, it's something that uh, I never thought that I would go through, especially at the age of 20. Um, it's something that definitely stayed with me. Um, it's something that I've had to learn how to get over. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I'm glad that I now know when something isn't right and I know when my body is trying to tell me that something is wrong. Um, and yeah, I just felt like it was important to actually talk about it because I want to kind of let go of that experience that I had and, you know, almost feel like a release, like feel like I'm not hiding something anymore. Um, and it's definitely not something that I purposely hid. It's just, um, something that I haven't had the strength to talk about until now. But yeah, obviously if you have any questions about my experience, please leave them down below. Um, 
or just if you want to say anything in general. Um, if you have suffered with sepsis, there's a really great online group called Sepsis Warriors um, that I've been using the past couple of days. Um, it's just a group for sepsis survivors and it's a really supportive community and a place where you can talk about your issues or stuff that you're worried about and get feedback from other people who know exactly what you've gone through. Um, and yeah, there's also uh, the UK Sepsis Alliance um, where you can donate to help with sepsis research and help spread the word about sepsis. Um, and yeah, so hopefully this was informative. Uh, hopefully you understand a little bit more about me and a little bit more about sepsis. Um, and yeah, thanks for watching. Hopefully my next video will not be as morbid and hopefully it won't be four years from now. Um, I might even make an update video after I have my surgery, so we'll see, but wish me luck. <laughs>